Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the age of disruptive innovation. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm the China Business, Finance, and Technology Editor for The Economist magazine. And it's my great pleasure to uh, be your uh, moderator, but also hopefully provocateur, as we have this uh, terrific panel of experts and business leaders uh, to talk about, I think, one of the most important dimensions of the new global economy. Now, when we talk about innovation, uh, in my experience, uh, it is one of the most abused and misused words in the English language. Uh, let me take a show of hands. Um, how many of you in this room are in favor of innovation? Put your hands up high. Okay, now uh, hands down. How many of you are against innovation? How many of you are anti-innovation? Think it's a terrible thing. Exactly. You see my point. So we can have an hour-long discussion about some kind of dimensions of innovation. Everyone thinks they agree, and they leave, and you find out that, in fact, you're talking about different things. Uh, and so let me not make that mistake. Let me offer you um, a definition of innovation. And I've spent uh, 20 years at The Economist thinking about this subject, and uh, as an old MIT engineer, I've thought a lot about the technological dimensions, but also about the economics, business, societal aspects of this. And uh, I'll be coming out shortly with a book called Need, Speed, and Greed, available at a good bookstore near you on the future of global innovation. And in that experience, I came up with one simple idea. First, what innovation is not. Innovation is not just technology. It's not IP. It's not gadgets and gizmos and patents. Uh, although it's often conflated with invention, it's different from invention and bigger than, I think. Uh, all those things are important, but in fact, if they don't create value, for a customer, for society, uh, for your employees, your shareholders. In my opinion, it's not innovation. Innovation is fresh thinking that creates value. And this doesn't have to be new technology. It can be a new, an old idea applied in a new place. Let me just give a small example. We know the Premier this morning talked about innovation and how important innovation is here in China. I would even posit that if we were to tackle the grand global challenges, be they ranging from resource constraints, one of the big themes of this uh, summer Davos, to climate change or uh, the uh, threat of deadly pandemics, uh, to an era in which urbanization, demography, aging uh, are posing enormous challenges to our health and other systems. We need to accelerate the meaningful pace of innovation in the world, I would argue. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be just technology. 140 years ago, America faced an energy crisis. But it's not what you think. It wasn't about transportation. Uh, the whalers in my native Connecticut managed to kill off most of the whales in the world for the blubber, which was used to light the lanterns of New England. So there was a major lighting crisis. And they sent, they knew there was some oil in Pennsylvania coming out of the rocks. And they thought, well, this could be a substitute fuel. And so a group of investors from New Haven sent a very shady character named Colonel Drake to Pennsylvania to see if he can find a way to harvest this new fuel. And like everyone else who was there, he started digging for oil. And of course, it didn't work. For months and months, they tried different places. And finally, the investors gave up. They said, Colonel, we're out of money. Come home. And on that day, out of sheer desperation and a flash of brilliance, he remembered his history books. He remembered that China had for centuries drilled for salt. And he said, let me try that, what the Chinese have tried. And of course, on that day, he hit a spectacular gusher of oil, inventing the modern oil industry, transforming the fortunes, first of lighting and ultimately of transportation, and empowering the century of oil. Now that is innovation. It wasn't a new technology, but it was an old idea applied in a new place, a new context, in a way that met an unmet need. I think that's really the essence of innovation. And when we talk about disruptive innovation, um, what are we really talking about? We're moving towards an era in which established business models, established technologies can be upended much more quickly. Um, and even at the level of industries, perhaps even with the rise of China and a number of other BRICS economies, uh, could it be at the level of countries? That's the question that many people around the world are grappling with. I'm delighted to say I have a distinguished panel here to help us think about this. Um, but let me turn, uh, perhaps for a little bit more clarity and to help us think about this a little smarter fashion than I have, um, to Joseph Schorndorf, who's a partner at Excel Partners, uh, a leading venture capitalist. He's a member of the foundation board here at the WEF uh, to help us think about disruptive innovation. Joseph. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here. Uh, 
This has been a bit of a momentous summer for me. I just finished 45 years uh, since I came to Palo Alto to go to work for a little innovative, almost startup called Hewlett Packard that was a $200 million company about to get in the computer business. And uh, companies like Intel, et cetera, et cetera, hadn't even been thought of at that point. So I've had a fairly good seat, if you will, at what's happened in the technology world. It occurred to me to just start by thinking about this subject by talking about some of the members of the forum who were not in business when Klaus started the World Economic Forum in the early 70s, just to make an example of disruptive innovation. And three that came to mind are Microsoft, started in the mid to late 70s, Cisco, started in the late 80s, Dell, started you know, in between those two. The forum was started in the early 70s. Now, what did Microsoft do? We, we tend to take it for granted now, but pre-Microsoft, the world ran on mainframes. There was a centralized infrastructure and employees were told what to do. Microsoft was the first Freedom Act that basically let people with PCs be empowered to solve their own problems. Dell wiped out, if you will, by selling direct. They, they disrupted a whole retail chain of events. And Cisco, a startup, and people, most people don't know this story, ended up buying IBM's networking business, SNA, because IBM would not change to an open standard. Now, as I think about it, and if we have time, you could look at all three of those companies who've become world leaders and say, now, where are they threatened by the next wave of disruption? And we'll talk about that, I hopefully, tomorrow. But I wanted to set the stage a little bit. Absolutely. I mean, you bring up a great point. And if we extend to the Fortune 500 or any of these other sorts of measures of leading companies, we know that um, large companies are dying, by and large, for various reasons. And um, most of the job growth, for example, in a country like the United States, uh, although last month there were no jobs created, if you were to take a 10 or 20 year perspective, uh, almost entirely created by small companies, new companies, new ideas, new businesses. Um, and increasingly, we're also finding uh, that we're, uh, the engines and drivers of this disruption is coming from the emerging world, of course. And one of the uh, great trends is in frugal engineering. Uh, and here we have a wonderful example of a company that has uh, grown to tremendous prominence uh, by being a disruptor. Um, we have uh, Liu Jiren, Chairman and Chief Executive of NewSoft. Uh, if I can turn to you to give a couple of thoughts on disruption. Okay. Uh, for uh, disruptive innovation for emerging nation means, uh, you know, as a business, we try to got new market space. So that means by provide uh, low cost services like uh, our product, like uh, our custom easy to access our services or product and uh, by value the society development to grow in our business, especially drive the consumption of the business. I can give you examples about uh, uh, healthcare. In China, if you say in past uh, you know, uh, 30 years, uh, the people accumulate uh, the wealth, but at the same time, the chronic diseases also increase very much. They use uh, you know, almost a double digital growth, much uh, higher than GDP. The people uh, be before is hungry, but now they have money, they eat so much, they don't spot in. And diabetes, the people's potential, the risk of people, or heart disease is the number one in the world. In, in is, uh, we have 90 million people have uh, diabetes, uh, the problem. We have around uh, 200 million people have uh, blood uh, issues. So if we look at the trends, who can pay this money? And we learn from US. If we, today we say Obama government, they, are, they had it up our budget of health care. I can say that kind of story will happen in China in the next 10 or 20 years. That budget, that kind of money will make this country like a bankrupt uh, because we cannot afford 1.3 billion people to spend a lot of money uh, like the U.S. today for health care. So tell me the potential, because um, I spent the last five years covering health care, including the U.S. health care reforms, a country that spends 18% of its GDP on health care, 
is, has a tremendous chronic disease problem, can't possibly afford this wave. And as you say, uh, China, India are following right behind uh, with the chronic disease problem. Uh, is there a potential for the technology, new business models, the things you're working on to uh, come to the rescue? What do you have in mind? Uh, the first thing, of course, you need to provide technology, which is uh, cheaper, uh, easy to access. We are lucky today we have a cloud computing, we have internet, wireless, communication, uh, like uh, we develop small terminal in rural areas that is increased all kind of uh, uh, measurement of uh, the body information which can be sharing by thousand family in small village. So we expand the knowledge of uh, medical care to the last uh, few hundreds to nearby the customer. We develop like a watch that a watch with a various function. You can measure all your movement, the function. You can got real-time advice based on the doctor's knowledge. So that is the way I can say we disrupt traditional healthcare model. We like the people spend only a, a few you know, dollars. Uh, they can take high-quality healthcare in the whole. So I think that is a way we can solve the problem of uh, cost of health care. It's not only just a budget, a lot of money for that. Let me pick up on that example. The, um, I think health care is a wonderful example. Energy would be another big, asset-intensive, inefficient industry that's quite ripe for disruption. And we may hear from one of our other speakers about some energy ideas from Korea. But just on the healthcare point, I want to underline it's not just about the technology, although the advances in technology are fantastic with you know, uh, miniaturization, the electronic medical records, the use of the cloud, um, uh, real-time sensors, uh, miniaturized uh, diagnostics and portable diagnostics. There's a revolution coming. Putting them together is a huge technological task. But ultimately, the insight that the great Clay Christensen, a Harvard professor who coined the phrase disruptive innovation had, it's not just about the new technology cheap hard drive storage was the one he looked at 30, 40 years ago. It is the business model that's attached to that. Uh, and that can sometimes kill even the best technologies or most promising technologies if you don't find a good business model uh, that offers good enough services. And I, I learned this myself very briefly. Uh, on the question of medical devices, China is a great frugal innovator, uh, as is India, countries that are developing uh, wonderful, cheap and cheerful technologies that are just good enough rather than the gold-plated scanners that might be uh, uh, very, very expensive and just a little bit better than the previous edition. GE is one of those companies, Philips, Siemens, a number of Western companies are learning from Chinese counterparts how to do frugal engineering, but are they taking it back to Europe and America and Japan where there are very high costs? So in fact, in, at least in the case of GE, I had a chance to interview Jeff Immelt recently and I asked him, why are these not being sold more prominently in the US? And one of the answers from his own healthcare chief was, this new product costs $10,000. My salesmen make more on a commission on their current $100,000 product that they sell than this new product's value. So I asked the chairman, Mr. Immelt, what do you say to this? He said, I'm going to have to find another way to pay my salesmen. I think that gives you a sense of the challenge to establish businesses because the wave is coming, as happened early on, for example, with uh, Japanese cars that initially were not so good but ultimately came to dominate the U.S. and other markets. It was a disruption. We saw it in steel. We saw it in shipbuilding. It will come in other industries. But what will the established industries giants do? And we have, in fact, a company that um, is now an established firm, and, and even though it's done its share of disrupting. Um, let me ask um, C.P. Gurani, Chief Executive Officer of Mahendra Satyam. Um, as an established company, now you have assets to defend. You have quarterly profits to worry about. Um, what do you do about disruptive threats from the new upstarts that are nibbling at your heels? I guess, uh, you know, with Joe here on the panel, uh, it's difficult to argue whether established global multinational is doing enough to, you know, look after the challenges that can come from any quarter. Uh, Joe talked about Silicon Valley and how a few companies were born, how the few companies he has seen grow. Uh, I mean, let me give you another perspective. The perspective is that a firm like ours, in IT sector, we employ about 65,000 people. If I look at the whole of Mahindra's, I mean, right from farm equipment to holidays, we have like 130,000 people. So yes, and ha having a presence in over 40 countries, 
I mean, you do realize that the culture of innovation, the culture of disruptive innovation, the culture of challenging your own business paradigms, I mean, it is not by serendipity. It, is, it, it has to be cultivated. So the, the right model that we work on is that we recognize that uh, there, is, there will be a challenger group which will come and challenge us. Instead of waiting for somebody else to challenge us, the way we foster that di disruptive innovation is, A, we focus on our own costs, we focus on our own growth, but more importantly is that we have within our own firm uh, people who challenge the conventional thinking, people who are challenging the current paradigm. And I can give you many examples, Vijay, as we go along, but, but the point here is that uh, we have to recognize that existing processes, existing value systems, existing structures are designed for sustenance, and if you have to recognize that there is a new player going to be in the market which will challenge you, whether it is healthcare. I mean, uh, I agree that there are, China and India have a similar examples. I mean, when we did a social inclusive project for emergency healthcare, we didn't copy US. US cost is $400 a 911 call. I mean, whereas we couldn't afford more than maybe $1. I mean, now, having identified a need, we decided how we are going to innovate, how we are going to do it differently, and how we are going to start definitely be a challenger to a technology that is coming in from U.S. So, so more, so more video when we talk. I heard yeah. two things there. First and um, last, you said um, uh, you see the potential for leapfrogging by not following the same path of, of maybe a. Uh, gold-plated or asset-intensive ways that are done in the OECD countries. I think that's a great uh, theme of modern business. Everyone in this room no is certainly familiar with that. But the other point you said was that even within your established organization, which uh, is really about incremental innovation, about delivering and sustaining profits, uh, you do have individuals who are uh, troublemakers, who, who will come up with provocative ideas. And so I think the challenge as, a, as a, a chief executive and for other senior managers is to nurture those people because uh, the, the organization has antibodies. And I see uh, Joseph nodding his head. He used to be at Hewlett Packard, a big company, um, and Xerox would be another big company where lots of great ideas came but uh, not necessarily were um, financially beneficial for the company. Uh, much of the internet, it is claimed in lore, was invented at Xerox Park, but uh, the company didn't make money on much of it. Again, this is a hypocritical story, but that's the storyline. Um, how, uh, how do you sustain your current profits even as you encourage and nurture those that might disrupt them so that you have the businesses of the future? Um, I, I know that um, uh, Takeshi Natsuno, uh, professor at Keio University of Japan, you've thought about this question mm -hmm. about um, the incumbents and how you deal with disruptive threats. And I think you might be a little bit more skeptical than some of our panelists. So tell us your <laughs> okay. view. Actually, you know, uh, if you look back at the history of the Japanese industry, you know, Japanese companies are ve were very good at the nothing, crazy ideas, and the, you know, provides funds and money to crazy guys. And actually, that was the source of disrupt disruptive innovation, actually, as well as incremental innovation. Mm. You know, these top executives didn't expect a lot from the from the bottom of app innovation for the first time, but the, after they found out, you know, that this innovation really works, then they set it up platform for innovation, both in terms of money and the incentive, and the, because of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of innovation came out from the industry. But the now. Big companies in Japan started to save R&D costs, started to save uh, you know, costs at minimum, and the, because of that, the money is not going to the innovative guys or crazy guys. So that is why you know, innovation from Japan is now you know, decreasing. So, so what I'm hearing is that there was a time where there was enough money and tolerance for the, the crazy guys at the bottom, not just the design from the R&D team, but unexpected surprises. But uh, as budgets have been cut, internally that's not happening. Um, and uh, let, me, let me turn to um, uh, Joseph Shondra for a minute because this connects with a point we were discussing in the, in the green room behind that um, uh, you think actually the cut in R&D across uh, the world is changing how innovation happens. I haven't seen the aggregate numbers, but if I just look at what I do see, and give you some quick examples, Hewlett Packard 
When I worked there in the 60s and 70s, and I was there 18 years, we spent 10 percent on R&D. You got the laser printer out of it, you got the handheld calculator, you got all the good products you know. They're down to 2 percent. One of the great institutions in this world was Bell Labs. You know, from that you got the transistor, which produced trillions of dollars of economic value. Uh, you had IBM Yorktown. I will just say to you, all the companies I've looked at that have been big technological innovators are in a process of decreasing, not increasing R&D. And what that's resulted in is a lot of the startups that we do are now being purchased by those bigger companies as a safer way to do R&D, i.e., the product is market tested. Now, it sounds like you're a little bit regretful that an era has passed. But l let, me, let me challenge you a little bit, if, if, if indeed that's what you think. Uh, um, isn't it also true that at the same time, we, uh, thanks to globalization and Googleization, uh, the trends that have upended the global economy, we are actually um, in a world with much more open innovation, where collaborative methods are actually the way forward. So, uh, you know, as Bill Joy famously said, uh, co-founder of Sun Microsystems, uh, the smartest people uh, in your industry don't work for, for your company. Uh, and that's even more true today than it might have been before uh, as we move towards an age of much more democratic innovation. Many more countries, many more bright ideas from around the world can contribute to the innovation process now. Isn't it perhaps good that you don't have ivory towers and instead have um, uh, perhaps maybe beacons? You have to be good enough to attract the best talent and to be able to work with Tsinghua University or uh, with uh, you know, a leading institute in India or Brazil. Uh, but nevertheless be able to work as a partner and collaborator, not in-house. Let me, I, I don't want to leave you with the wrong impression. We were talking specifically about big company R&D. Sure. In the 45 years I've been in Silicon Valley, I have never seen more innovation underway in the Valley than I have today, almost by an order of magnitude. Wow. Um, and I wrote down quickly five areas. And it's mostly startups, I think, is what you're talking about. It, most of it is. Right. Uh, you look at Infotech as we move to the cloud, the number of companies that are in that area that are doing some pretty spectacular things. I was at a conference on Saturday, Neurotech. There were a hundred startups in a conference that's going to happen, brain science, uh, gene tech. Uh, when uh, Craig Venner and Francis Collins decoded the human genome, they spent $250 million to do the first one. We can do it for under $1,000 today, Silicon Valley startups, and the cost of decoding the human genome is coming down at five times the rate of Moore's Law. Right. We don't have a name for the law, but it's five times faster. Uh, you look at clean tech and the innovations that are going on there, uh, I've never seen uh, so many parallel tracks. It's just not coming from the traditional sources, and right. that's my point. Great. So in, in some sense, a golden age for innovation. I want to um, come to the audience in just a moment uh, after I, um, I turn to our final panelists. So I just want to alert you, please get your questions together. Um, we'll put them to our, uh, our good gurus on stage. Uh, let, me, let me turn to um, uh, Sunam Pyo, who is uh, president of Christ University, uh, the Korea Advanced Institute of um, Science and Technology. Um, you've set, certainly had a, a great perch on which to look at um, Korea's leapfrogging. Uh, but I wondered if you could start by connecting the dots to the startup culture that has uh, been just talked about. Um, Korea historically has uh, made its way through Chai Bol and large institutions. Um, can you tell us, is that changing? Um, you yourself are involved with some startup ventures, I know. Uh, are we going to see a big startup culture in Korea? Is it, is it going to tap into the, the trends that uh, Joseph uh, Schondorf just mentioned? Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I can respond to uh, the way you phrased the problem. We started out to solve most important problems of the 21st century. For a university, that's a luxury we have. We are not looking for making money, but we wanted to solve problems of the humanity of the 21st century. So we identified four areas, E, E, W, S, energy, environment, water, and sustainability. And as part of this effort, we are lucky to get fairly major funding during the last two years, we started this uh, particular project two years ago, and we spent about $50 million. And today, we created what we call OLEV, Online Electric Vehicle. In two years, we installed the new, complete new ways of running 
automobiles. The purpose of this project was to eliminate internal combustion engines. That's a very ambitious goal, eliminate internal combustion engines from our streets. So what we do is we provide power, electric power from underground cable to the moving vehicle. So the moving vehicle has only small battery, so it can go anywhere. So as a result of this effort, we demonstrate it can be done. We installed three systems taking passengers around Seoul, Grand Park, and now there is a company in the United States and there's a company in, the, in Korea trying to commercialize these new uh, technologies. Uh, so just to be clear, is this a university venture or a, a joint venture, something we you own out? 30, We own 30 percent, investors own 70 percent in, in both the, uh, in, in the U.S. as well as in Korea. And the whole point is the following. Um, there are many different ways of introducing disruptive uh, innovation. And we started out as a research goal, trying, trying to see how we can replace internal combustion engines. And most big companies did not take us very seriously. In fact, we approached large companies that make automobiles. They all turned us down. They did not want to talk to us because they didn't think uh, this is the kind of technology they want to see developed. So today, um, it's a major accomplishment, in my opinion, that in two years, we developed technology, we deployed it in Seoul City, and then uh, we have investors trying to uh, make Do it work. Do you think that this is a, uh, going to be a more common phenomenon in Korea? I hope so, because you know, most, uh, big, uh, most big Korean companies succeeded by taking on technologies and products that are pretty much well established in the marketplace. Right. And then they became more competitive, made a better products, and then they uh, were very successful in competing DRAMs to uh, cars, what have you. And that, was, that has been the Korean formula for success. Now we are saying that Korea cannot grow anymore based on that kind of strategy. They need to innovate. So this is where we come in. Let me, um, many follow-ups for our team, but uh, let's see if we can uh, get some questions in from the audience, and we'll continue the dialogue. I see a gentleman with a hand near the front. Uh, let's get a microphone. Again, the ground rules, as ever, uh, please identify yourself, wait for the microphone, and I ask you, please make it a, a short and sweet question, not a long gas bag intervention. Nobody likes that. Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm M.K. Singhi from Sri Cement India, a sustainable company. My question to Mr. Gurnani, how do you manage failures in innovative process? Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Singhi, you'll have to repeat the question. How do you manage failures? Failures oh, failure. in innovative process. Yes. I think again, uh, you know, just a small background to the world around us, the way it is changing. Uh, the fundamental fact is that, you know, the sector, IT or the uh, technology sector that I represent, it is evident that technology at home today is superior to the technology at work. The examples are that at home you use a tablet, at home you used the Microsoft Kinects or the Wii kind of a games. At the games that you use, the user interfaces are a lot better and better in real time. Now, the, 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 the only way to do it, as I said, is that internally within a large organization, you create a fractal, you create smaller groups which are challenging. And sometimes it could be two or three groups addressing a similar challenge. Now, if this is Can a, you give an example of one that has failed where you didn't fire the guy in charge? Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> many, many of them. I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, uh, so now mobility has become the buzzword today, whether it is uh, enterprise mobility or whether it is in terms of uh, you know, uh, seeing the smaller screen or the big screens. Now, we, we invested a fair amount on a technology called WiMAX. Now, the reality is Intel, Motorola, and some of us invested a lot on that WiMAX technology, and that technology, because of the 2008 crisis, and eventually an LTE, which is a 4G, what we now know as, I mean, uh, got enough time to catch up. Now, one way of looking at it is that my investment of where I was looking at disruptive innovation for WiMAX was a failure, and I, uh, you know, I write it off. But the other way was that 
we learned so much in mobility that we were able to re-channelize that energy into LTE. So, no, we didn't fire. We actually promoted the vice president who was running WiMAX Lab. Well, that's, that's, that's a great example. I mean, one of the key lessons about um, uh, how to think about innovation is, of course, um, to learn how to fail gracefully. Uh, this is easy to say, but it's very difficult to do. Um, you know, the endless number of books in Harvard Business School and other kinds of INSEAD uh, case studies written about failure and why managers need to learn to manage failure. It is very difficult to take type A driven people, all of whom want your CEO jobs, your uh, uh, deputies, and tell them that it's okay to fail. They don't like to fail. We like to hide our failures. And most importantly, the lessons that could be learned by sharing failures more widely with the organization are typically buried. And so a sign of good companies are ones where they actually, um, and w one company I know actually throws a, a party they, just to celebrate shutting down of a project that didn't work, where they discuss and disseminate the findings so that other people in the company don't make that mistake again. I think that's the kind of new age we're living in as innovation and the metabolism of disruption increases around the world. There are more and more chances now uh, or shots being taken, shots on goal against established businesses. It's not that the powers of incumbency have gone away, it's that the barriers to entry are dropping. And so you're getting more and more new ideas, new technologies, new contenders coming at you. So internally you have to try more often and be a little bit more resilient with those failures. I think that's one of the lessons that uh, the experience uh, just described highlights. Um, let's take another question from the floor. Uh, I see a, a lady on my right. Let's get a microphone there. And then I see another lady here right in front of me. We'll come to you next. Again, please identify yourself and a, and a question rather than a, a long comment. Thank you. Stephanie Loder. I'm from Rio Tinto in India. I'd like to understand, and perhaps I'll direct this question to Mr. Natsuno. With your understanding of innovation, is it better to give somebody a target like I'm going to use the Indian example of the Tata Nano car. There was the one lakh car. Is it better to give people a target of what they need to achieve or to give them a concept? Actually, you know, uh, if you look back at the uh, industry history, you know, uh, so many R&D things took place in the history of the Japanese auto industry and the other telecom industry and the many industries. But, the, you know, if you look back, the roadmaps they made in first. Nothing was on the roadmap, <laughs> nothing. And the, you know, uh, some, some project was accelerated and some project were not, 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 not progressed at all. And the, but the, you know, all the managers actually, uh, always know this innovative culture as it is, regardless of the failure or the success. And the, as you know, Japanese companies are very famous for seniority system and long term employment, long life, um, uh, lifetime employment system. And the, in the system, you know, they nursed crazy guys as a result. As a result, they didn't expect as a result. But the, recently, this tendency has changed because of the economic crisis, actually. And they, they didn't allow, they, they are not capable of allowing these crazy guys still living in the company and they, you know, begging down the money. So, uh, and because of that, you know, investment to new world, investment for um, efficient uh, things would be less and less and less. And on the, on the contrary, you know, the banking system and the financial system in Japan is also big company oriented and they didn't provide anything to startups. Because of that, you know, as a total number of innovative things from Japan is decreasing as a trend. But the, Japan has money as a country. So uh, if we change a little bit for the financial supporting system, then I, I believe you know, uh, these new innovations will revive again. Let me just add a, a small thought to that. Um, uh, of course, you're talking about the tension between top-down and bottom-up. Um, uh, one of the schools of thought that has uh, come in fashion and thinking about innovation is design thinking. Um, and one of the arguments there is that if you give innovators a blank piece of paper, it's actually quite difficult, whereas des uh, designers love to have some constraints to your point about targets or goals. Uh, giving some constraints, but not too many, is, is a way to unleash creativity, whereas just giving a blank piece, piece of paper may not produce the results that you want. Now, I think there's another question I saw the hand before. 
and we'll come here to you next, and then we'll go to the back next. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Magstad. I'm the China correspondent for the BBC Public Radio International program, The World. This is a question for Liu Jiren. We were talking about failure and the need to accept failure to be able to promote innovation. I'm wondering how you feel that's going in China. Um, there's a lot of pressure for researchers to come up with patents, to come up with journal articles, to come up with innovations, and it's sort of up or out. How do you deal with it at your company, and what sorts of evolutions and changes are you seeing in the broader society related to this question? Uh, I, I think the driver for, for the news of to take uh, activity of innovation is we try to understand what is, uh, is the demand from a marketplace, how to value that society. So uh, that is the way uh, we are not easy to make a mistake. So if we say, what is the demand, big demand of this, uh, this emerging uh, nation when uh, GDP for each of family, they got a more income. I think two areas we are, we are very much focused on. One is healthcare, another is education. That is money should be paid by each of family, each of individuals, and also this government. If you look at what is the pressure of a government, uh, we make uh, like a 12, uh, you know, five years uh, the planning. I do believe, just like uh, uh, Premier Mr. Wen Jiabo mentioned, a lot of money will invest for that area. So then we're thinking about how to like normal people. I mean, the people have a very low income in the rural areas. They can access high quality services by pay very, very low price. And then we try to integrate the technology by open innovation. We don't do everything by ourselves. But, so, but let, me, let me jump in. I mean, the, the, I think um, you've certainly persuaded me and many people in the room this is a great thing to do. But to the, the questioner's uh, point, uh, are you taking risks? Will you, are you, will you allow your researchers to fail? You know, the, the, the innovation process is, is, is the question. Um, in this process, are you uh, designing the opportunity for some of your key people to make mistakes without paying the ultimate price. Yeah, yeah that, that is I mentioned. So the risk means uh, if you have a wrong direction, you will take a big risk. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, right choices, uh, that uh, you, you, need to, you need to very much a patient, you need to invite to continue to do that for long-term arrangement for your uh, manage your R&D uh, behavior. So uh, I think uh, most of the risk is because the first the big risk is you lose opportunity. You, you don't take a risk Right. That means uh, you're, you're, it's a big risk if you don't take a risk. So another thing, the opportunity will come in a little bit delayed. So whether you have enough resources, whether you really arrange your resources to waiting some days coming. So that is what we did. So uh, we are not uh, enough money from uh, resources, from uh, capital, compared with multinational company, we are still small, we are weak, but every time, uh, I do believe we catch a lot of a new opportunity in this country because we wake up very early, we are very much a patient, we know how to build innovation platform by uh, corporate with um, many of uh, stakeholders, not only ourselves. All right. Well, let's um, see this lady here who was very patient, and then I'll go uh, all the way to the back where I see a gentleman's hand there for now. Let's get a question here. Please identify yourself. Can I speak uh, in Chinese? I want to ask a question to President Liu of Chairman, uh, Chairman of Newsoft. I'm with the China Business News. Just now you talked about innovation. You used to be a B2B company, and now you are switching to B2B plus B2C. So my question is, why are you carrying out this transformation? Is it because you are facing new business barriers, new business challenges? That's my first question. Secondly, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So I see the, the people in here mostly uh, understood English, so I, I respond in English. So, uh, if you talk about the business model, we, we're talking about that disrupt, uh, disruptive innovation is not only a business model, uh, not only technology. That is uh, integrate the uh, demand of the society, integrate a business model, integrate a technology. We're talking about before, like New South, we take a B2B model, is our model. But today, we take a BBC, that 
that means B2B, B2C. Why are we doing that? It's because we have 3,000 hospitals is our big customer. If we expand hospital services by cloud, by internet, to come to each of individuals, to the home, so we make an exactly different model, that is BBC. So that the B will value, I mean we value of that, all the hospitals will be very much happier because they got the millions of customers that cannot be used, a traditional model they cannot afford for millions of customers to come to the hospital. But today, they use their knowledge, they use the internet, you can manage all the patients in the home, especially for aging society of China. So that is, uh, we, we're talking about, that is a new marketplace. That place, we got a lot of customers in very low income, but our customers, we value not only ourselves. 3,000 hospitals is very much happy to say, today the hospital can manage millions of people who is stay in home, use their own facility, use their own room, but they can access high quality health care. Let's go to the back row. There's a gentleman who's been very patient. Your name, please. Let me ask a question in Chinese. I'm uh, with a Chinese online banking magazine. I have a question for the moderator. In Premier Wen's speech this morning, during the 12th five-year plan period, China will become a highly innovative country. Just now, the U.S. speaker and the Japanese professor are also talking about the disruptive uh, innovation and the gradual approach innovation. So, in your opinion, which approach in innovation would be most suitable for China? Thank you. Well, um, I think the real experts are here on the panel, so I will I'll defer to them, but I'll give you uh, one or two sentences of, of my view, and that is I think uh, China is already a, a tremendously innovative country, um, but one has to look at economic history uh, and see uh, what, is the, what is the way that countries develop. And traditionally, it has been through catch-up growth, to use the phrase of the economists, uh, that is leading economies spend the money and, and the expense at the technological frontier, the so-called bleeding edge, to, uh, to invent new breakthrough technologies. And ultimately, the rest of the world benefits. It's not a zero-sum game. I think that's the fundamental fallacy a lot of people have when they posit that the rise of China is bad for America or some of these arguments one hears in U.S. politics. I think that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, the rise of Japan was not bad for the West. On the contrary, it's a rising tide that lifted many boats. Uh, and similarly, the rise of China as an innovative economy can be a rising uh, tide that lifts the global economy. But historically, I think it would be a mistake to think that it, China's innovation will be exactly the same as Silicon Valley in every way. Uh, historically, it has been through adoption and diffusion uh, and advancement up the innovation curve that countries have, have moved up the innovation channel. The great question mark today and why we're having this conversation about disruption is could there be something new under the sun? In other words, is it possible to leapfrog? And we have seen with mobile telephony in Africa, for example, uh, where going without fixed lines, going straight to the cell phone or mobile phone, there are examples. Um, and healthcare in the rich world might be an example of very asset heavy industries that are slow to move. And such is the pace of exponential technology growth these days uh, that developing countries can leapfrog to the latest and best technologies with better business models. And that's really what we've talked about. And I might, I might turn to Joseph to offer a thought on this question, since I know you spent a long time thinking about this. Uh, I want to go back to, to answer that, I want to go back to the failure issue because uh, failure is actually the key to innovative success. Uh, people ask me all the time, you know, what is it about Silicon Valley that makes it Silicon Valley? Well, first of all, it's nothing about the people because if you go into Silicon Valley today, it looks like this room, meaning there's somebody from everywhere working there. We have funds in the U.S., our 11th fund, in Europe, Israel, our third fund, in India, our second fund, in China, our third fund. We only work with early stage companies. That's what we do. Some of the companies we have started that you might know about, Facebook, Groupon, Dropbox. Take a famous company, look at its IPO, look at the management team that built that company, Google or study their background, 
Many, if not most of them, were in a company that failed, that shut down, i.e., the key to great innovation is the ability to tolerate and even celebrate abject failure. And unfortunately, as we go around the world, that culture is not in place everywhere in the spirit of Davos and being open. While in Silicon Valley, if we fail, you, as I said to one of the prime ministers uh, who was very much against the failure model because it created unemployment and you can't shut down a company, I said most of the people in Silicon Valley can change jobs the next week and stay in the same carpool. Uh, you go to Germany, just to give you another example, failure there pretty much puts a lifetime stamp on you in the society which takes away the ability to take risk. And great innovation requires great risk and it requires the ability to fail because most companies, the majority of companies in Silicon Valley, fail. Uh, great answer. Uh, let's uh, go to this side of the room where I've been very neglectful and I apologize. Um, uh, prove me wrong by showing lots of hands and good questions on this side. Anybody over there? Really? So I've neglected you for a good reason? All right. Let's um, stick with the back row or near the back. I see a gentleman there. Yes, right where the microphone is. Please identify yourself. Well, uh, I'm Shengen Fan uh, from International Food Policy Research Institute. Uh, could you, the panel, the panelists and the moderator, to look at the role of intellectual property rights in making sure that small innovative ideas can be translated into large, large-scale innovations that can serve the whole society? Ideas like golden rice? Well, not including golden rice, you know, right. biofortification crops or okay. kinds of innovations. Um, anyone want to tackle this question on intellectual property rights? to a start that you're not going to like. Uh, we see hundreds of business plans that come in to us. Somebody comes in and says, here's a great piece of IP, and the front uh, of their pitch is, and here's our patents. We tend to go to sleep because, yes, we hear all of this about patents, and Motorola just got bought by Google for billions of dollars for patents, and patents and patents and patents. For little companies to succeed, they have one thing that causes them, think about this. We do startups and all of these companies up here are billion dollar companies and have lots of resources. I'm talking about the Fortune 500. What do little companies have? Speed. That means they've got to innovate and then they've got to innovate again and then they've got to innovate again. And if they're counting on patents to protect them, the next thing you know, they'll be caught up in patent fights for two or three years, which they can't defend. So what, what we want is teams that can quickly innovate, innovate and then replace that innovation with a better innovation. I see uh, Liu Jiren has been shaking his head uh, positively. Do you want to add a small thought to that? I think, uh, you know, the people ask uh, IPR issues, uh, mostly they are concerned about how to use the IPR in China because uh, many of multinational companies very much uh, worry about the IPR, how to protect the IPR in China. Uh, you know, we are a software and service company. We have the same kind of issues. Uh, when I found this company in, uh, 20 years ago, I make a first uh, software company. I sell, I try to sell the copies, but that software will be copied by somebody else just one year. I cost almost all our investment. But I learned something. If you really want to make uh, you know, business success in this country, you need to move more fast. It's, you, you, you don't just keep something in your hand. You say you have something valuable. And then from that day, we just uh, like a uh, you know, runner. Every day we wake up early, we are run, we run. And we look at the bike, we say, what is our target? So you, you don't try yeah. to protect you, just uh, nothing. Today's technology is a commodity. So you can find something, two solutions, two answer. One thing, you don't know other people already, somebody had. Secondly, you find something, never have a value. You try to keep that. You say that is your wealth. That is a totally mistake. I think to protect yourself, the interest of business move fast. 
always fast than your competitor. That is uh, our solution. That's a, a tough advice, but I think very much consistent with the idea of a world in which uh, the very rules of innovation are changing, where thanks to openness, thanks to the risk that's involved, thanks to the way that we connect more rapidly, the metabolism innovation changing, I think that's very powerful advice. It's hard to do. It's easier in software, for example, than if you are making cars or steel or um, developing you know, uh, biotech drugs that might take many years. It is more difficult, but I think inevitably, my argument would be, um, patents will become less important even as we continue to reward innovators in other ways. And so I think innovation deserves its rewards, but it may not be through the traditional notion of keeping patents close to your chest. I think that's the picture that's emerging. Let's get another question here. This gentleman here, straight ahead um, in the blue tie, has been waiting for a long time. Yeah, no, uh, back with the gray suit. Uh, my name is uh, Ivar Christensen from the Nordic Innovation in Norway. I have a question uh, to Gonani uh, about when you are a big company developing a new disruptive business model uh, at the same time as you have a profitable ongoing business model, how do you, from a management point of view, uh, handle that challenge, having a new business model coming and at the same time have a profitable business model running? give you an example not so much from my own company but from one of the most well quoted uh, um, you know innovation disruptive innovation case studies from india which was a nano car a $2000 car which was ultimately going to disrupt the auto sector the completely disrupt the scooter industry and the motorcycle industry now when you look at that creation, I mean, it is not that Tata Motors went out of business and uh, did not produce their trucks, did not produce their other cars, did not produce their multi-utility vehicles. Now, if you look at that case study, it was clear that you can coexist and you can decide to be disruptive or replace a certain set of the market. Now, two years later of that launch, you may come back and say maybe it was a failure because the plant which was designed for 100,000 cars a month is currently maybe producing 20,000 cars a month. Now, when you look at that again as a case study, you would realize is it wasn't a fault in uh, creating a product. It wasn't a fault in bringing in a product. It wasn't a fault in being able to deliver a $2,000 product. But the fault became in marketing and positioning. Marketing and positioning is that it got sold as a fourth car or a third car to an existing family instead of a replacing a motorcycle or a scooter. So my personal submission is that I, you know, again, I'm repeating is that uh, innovation can coexist, can be a part of the DNA of a large company, but it has to be driven from the top and you need to address uh, and you need to make sure is that you have a balance of mavericks, you have a balance of people who are devoted to it and a CXOs devote sufficient time to challenge what they already have. Uh, yes, a gentleman very in animated in the second row, I think uh, might be one of our last questions. Uh, please, short and sweet. Uh, David Chen from Microsoft. China's uh, new priority is to change its pattern of growth from a labor-intensive to resource-intensive to innovative, knowledge-based. However, people are concerned that the China cannot do that very successfully because of lacking of IP protection or IP environment. Uh, China is full of talents, um, but you know, not a great uh, software company or for reasons that you mentioned. The question is that what's your view on that? If you agree, what's your advice to China? Again, uh, it takes a long time to build a services business. And the main reason of building a services business is because it takes, what you're trying to earn is that I call software services business as a risk management business. The reason I call it a risk management business is that when somebody, whether it is a new company, 
giving you a product development or whether it's a large company like a General Motors giving you their maintenance and testing services, they're basically asking you to take over their risks. Because it is not that they don't need the maintenance, it's not that they don't need the testing, they need it 24 by 7, it is mission critical. Now, but to build but, uh, that confidence... Just, just, just because time is short, um, let me, let me uh, get to the, the sharp point that the gentleman put, which you're very effectively ducking. Um, are you worried, for example, in China your crown jewels will be stolen? Sorry? Uh, the, the crown jewels of your uh, uh, IP will, will not be protected in this country. I think that was the point of the question. I, I believe that, uh, it, you know, there are two things, obviously, that uh, if were to. So number one is the time, I mean, that you need to be able to develop the confidence. Uh, and number two, I think, is that uh, while all of us believe that in, in China has the largest uh, a fairly large English-speaking population, but I still believe that there's a huge gap in colloquial English and being able to communicate effectively. And number third is that for many companies, there is a perceived notion that their IP or their uh, assets are not safe out here. Okay. So I guess it needs to be addressed. All right. I think that's um, going to be the... Uh, the last word from the panelists, just because we're, we're just about out of time. Let me just take um, a, a brief uh, 60 seconds to, 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 to summarize. It, it would be impossible to summarize all the points, but I think you get the flavor. We have a whole track on innovation during this summer Davos, to which, of course, uh, I expect to see lots of you here with so many questions. I can see this is a topic that you're interested in deeply. Um, we are in an age of tremendous grand global challenges. We know this. This is one of the great themes of the Davos conferences. Uh, dealing with them, I would argue, requires uh, uh, accelerating the pace of global innovation. And we are beginning to see, in, in the ways that we've discussed on this stage, um, uh, a faster metabolism in the way that innovation happens, and as well the greater potential for disruption. Uh, I think that we can expect a lot more coming. And this creates both peril as well as opportunities. I think that's really the point. Uh, for those companies that are complacent, especially the established companies, uh, you can expect to go the way, as Joseph pointed out, of the founding members of the World Economic Forum who are no longer members or, or who weren't there at the creation, let's put it that way, or of the Fortune 500 companies that no longer exist. But equally, think of the new Microsofts to come and their Chinese and Indian and Brazilian equivalents. Uh, these are being created every day as well. So it's a time of extraordinary risk but equally extraordinary opportunity. Um, I think you'll agree that our panelists have done a wonderful job in uh, taking on these big issues. Please join me in giving them and the organizers a round of applause. Thank you very much.